Good evening, everybody. My name is John Lohr, and I am the chair of the Finance Committee. And today is February, I got to check, February 7th of 2024. And we'd like to start off first by having all the Finance Committee members introduce themselves, starting off to my left. Sarius. Peter Underhill. Joyce Boyardi. Michael Crone. Kathy McInnes. Thank you, and I believe the meeting is being recorded, so people at home can view this either now or at a more convenient time. Mr. Chair, may I make a statement? Yes, please. I'd like to welcome the new chair of the uh, Finance Commission, Mr. Lohr. Thank it's you. It's his first meeting, um, so we're going to take the tape and turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have every faith you'll do a great job, so congratulations on your first uh, your first meeting. Thank you very much. It'll be uh, We have a lot to do. Uh, it'll be exciting. So. Without further ado, we will jump right into it. We have Chief Rick Barrett here for Fire and Rescue, and he will start off with his uh, department and budget. Excellent. Thanks for having me. I'm going to share my screen. Well, again, thank you uh, for having me tonight, and uh, thank you for the questions that you provided uh, leading up to this. Um, I think that's a great idea. It gives us an opportunity to prepare for something maybe we didn't have <coughs> already. Um, I feel comfortable that in this presentation I answer all those questions, and if I don't, please, we can discuss them afterwards. Um, I will take questions during it. You know, I'll pause every once in a while to see if there's anything, um, but please feel free to go ahead and ask. So, uh, just a couple quick slides on <coughs> kind of who we are, what we do. Um, you know, it seems pretty straightforward, but we're, you know, we're the fire department. We are the uh, Swiss Army knife of the uh, public safety. You know, we do everything um, from fires, medical emergencies, gas emergencies, motor vehicle accidents, to lockouts, public assist, and pumping basements. Um, whatever you need, fire department will help you. Our staffing hasn't changed much from last year. Um, you'll see uh, it stayed pretty much consistent with one full-time fire chief. We did lose an on-call deputy fire chief. Um, and then uh, our full-time staff are 16 members, uh, four full-time lieutenants, 12 firefighter EMTs, and 13 on-call firefighters. Our on-call firefighters uh, come back and supplement the uh, full-time members and help us cover shifts and handle any calls that are bigger than what the uh, on-duty staff can handle. Again, you know, we're really proud about our community involvement. Uh, we're really kind of everywhere that <coughs> we can be, uh, from this senior center uh, to the high school. We're part of four senior projects again this year. Um, one of them we're working with a high school senior, the DPW, and Rockies. Uh, his project is to paint all the fire hydrants in town, or at least start a process. And the goal is to uh, publicize it and make it so people can work with Rockies and the DPW, get the paint, and paint them outside your house. Uh, we've changed the color to the town colors, the school colors, um, kind of like we did with the fire department apparatus. So it's kind of a fun project, and uh, you know, again, these kids come up with these projects that benefit the town in whole. Last year was an AED project, um, so it's good to see this stuff happening, and we love partnering up with them. <clears throat> um, so accomplishments, we measure them a little bit different than I think a lot of people. <laughs> For us, you know, the biggest thing that we've had to deal with this year um, is the increase in call volume. Uh, we've talked about this for years. I've prepped everybody saying that it was coming and, you know, we're really starting to see it a lot. Um, the thing that I'm most proud of is that we prepared for it and we staffed for it. You know, for the last three to five years, we've been talking about, um, you know, the increase in call volume coming, and we've put the people in the position to respond to those calls. Um, without adding a lot of staff or, you know, telling you I'm going to add a lot of staff, we are handling the call volume that is current, and we're in a position to handle uh, the call volume that's coming in the near future. The biggest thing that jumps out uh, that you'll see is what we call simultaneous calls. Um, we had a huge jump this year. Last year we were about 200 times that we had uh, multiple calls at the same time. 
Uh, this year it jumped up to 410. Uh, that means while we are on a call, another call will come in. Uh, and it's just a weird kind of coincidence that then we get another call. Um, perfect example is today. Um, Mrs. McGinnis may have heard the crash outside her home today, but we had uh, double medicals this morning where first ambulance was out, 20 minutes later, we had another one, second ambulance had to go out, middle of the day, another double medical call, <clears throat> and then tonight was uh, the big one, five calls within an hour. Um, we had three medicals, um, a gas leak, and an MVA down near Oak Grove. We were able to handle four out of the five. Um, our staff went to all five, but we had to bring in a third ambulance just because we didn't have it. So that was, that was just today. Um, like I said, we're seeing this a lot, um, and I welcome anybody to listen to the radio so you can hear it because um, it is a, a, a really strange coincidence for us. You know, it used to be we get a call, two, three hours later you get another call, and now they're just kind of piling up. But that's ha that happens with the increase in call volume, and we've definitely, um, you know, seen a lot of that. What I'm most proud of is that we handle 90% of those calls. We only bring in <clears throat> mutual aid when we just don't have an ambulance to transport somebody. Um, and that's all done by the dedication of the staff, our on-call members coming back. Um, you know, five calls takes a lot of people to respond to. Um, and we were able to do it all um, just with our staff. So it's a, it's a big accomplishment for me. Um, another accomplishment that we look at that's, again, different is the structure fire. <clears throat> a lot of people would say, how's the structure fire, you know, an accomplishment? Well, when the structure fire is in a three-story apartment complex that has 38 units and 75 residents, um, it's a big deal. When you arrive on scene, third floor is on fire, 38 people trying to evacuate, and you show up with four and two police officers. And you're able to evacuate that whole building, extinguish the fire before it extends, controlling it to the third floor, <coughs> rescue 18 pets, um, resuscitate three with our animal control, unfortunately lose one, but then set up a temporary shelter, work with the school department and the police department to evacuate all those people to this shelter, our town hall staff to step up and be able to man that shelter, provide food, provide uh, electricity, blankets, pillows, anything that the residents needed to, uh, you know, feel comfortable in the building while their homes are burning. And again, like I said, this was an accomplishment for the whole town of Millis. You know, our police department, our DPW, our school, and our town hall staff. It's, it was just an incredible day. To the point we even went further where, you know, uh, Red Cross stops at a certain time. They don't help you out. Um, and the Millis Fund, we were able to reach out to them, get some funding. We were able to get two or three hotel rooms for the people who couldn't find lodging. And... Uh, they, they funded them for two or three days. And again, that's our small little town of Millis. So again, for me, huge accomplishment, a, a real feeling of pride. I made sure I passed that along to the select board and all the, all the uh, town employees because it was, it was just, you know, we're so small, but we all just kind of come together. So that was a big day for us. <clears throat> and again, something I'm very, very proud of. So again, we, we talk a lot about the call volume, you know, and I know one of the questions was, what's up with the call volume? <laughs> You know, so we've seen it jump, <coughs> you know, medicals up to 957 calls this year. Um, that's big. Our mutual aid is up as well. And that's <coughs> because of the service we're able to provide. You know, we've, we made that jump to ALS almost six years ago. Um, and the towns around us are just growing just like us and just as busy as we are. And they can only staff so much. And when they can't staff, where the town going with them. Could you just define ALS for us? Sure, advanced life support. So when we, <clears throat> we made the jump from EMT to paramedic, um, and we're able to provide that service to our mutual aid partners, we actually respond to three towns and we provide the ALS for them. They're not at that level, uh -huh. uh, like a lot of towns did for us while we were trying to get to the uh, system. Town of Sherman, Town of Holliston, and we've gone to Dover. Uh, I've been here 26 years. We went to Dover twice uh, in the last month. We've been there three times. Um, it's just that these towns <coughs> are in the same kind of boat, you know, and they're just, they don't have the, some of the full-time staff, and they're just not able to uh, handle the call volume they're starting to see as well. So when we say we provide intercept, that means we arrive on scene, 
they have an ambulance, but they can't provide ALS. Our paramedics get into their truck with our equipment, and we treat that patient. Now, with all those towns, we have mutual aid agreements, ALS agreements. So when we get into their truck, we start treating, we get a portion of their revenue that they get from that call. If we go to that town and we take the whole call, we get the whole reimbursement for it. So we're not going there just for free. Um, like I said, you see the mutual aid jumped about 100. <clears throat> our public assists are still up. Our intercepts are up a little bit. Um, you know, and the difference between ALS and BLS calls, you can see we do a lot more ALS calls than we do BLS calls. Um, Good question. Yep. Um, are you finding that the increase is age appropriate is because of age? And are you expecting this to increase over the next few years because communities are aging? We will. So again, um, I, the answers are in the slides. I'm going to jump on to the next slide and we'll, we'll get right to that. Because it is. You know, we mentioned this last year. Lowest is 44%, well, 42%, uh, no, it's 44. No, 42% involve patients over uh, the age of 55. I said the other day, I'm approaching that age. We all get... <laughs> How am I at that level? And 55 is not that old, but that's that's what our number is. 44% of Millis is over the age of 55. I list the areas that we have a lot of these 55 communities: Regency, Acorn Place, Anthology, Kennedy, and Harry King Terrace. Rockville Meadows isn't on here, or is Acorn Place? Oh, Acorn Place is there. So we're seeing an increase in call volume due to those. <clears throat> when we look at the call locations that we're going to, we go to a certain amount of places frequently. And it's just because of population. It's a dense population. Um, <clears throat> we added the new anthology of Millis up on Dover Road. It's a great facility. We really like working with them, and they've been a great partner. But they have patients there um, that you know, happen to fall a lot, have true medical emergencies, and we're there quite a bit. You know, We kind of warned everybody about this years ago when it started coming in. You know, We said we're going to be there six to eight times a week. We're there right now, three to five. They're at about 30% capacity. Mm. Um, so, and we're not going there for frivolous calls. Uh, you know, we put in place a lift assist policy that if we're just going there and just picking them up, putting them back in bed, we have a fee that we charge them. Uh, we've done that once over the whole year. They are true medical emergencies when we respond there. So I list some of the places, like I said, Anthology, Stony Brook Drive. Again, dense population, we're there quite a bit. Harry King, Kennedy Terrace, Regency, Willowbrook, Acorn Place, and then the two physician services in town. You know, these are where we see our, the most repetitive calls going to um, are at these locations. Any questions? Yeah. Yes. So when you say um, the, the physician groups, is that uh, somebody goes in there and they realize it's an emergency, they get yeah. to the hospital? Yep. So a lot of times we'll go in there and somebody will go and see their primary care with chest pain. And the primary care, he's very limited what he can do. He can diagnose it, but then they need to be in an emergency room. Uh, a lot of people will show up, difficulty breathing, you know, they've waited too long, and then we'll, we'll transport. So we're headed uh, 969 Main Street, uh, the Newton Wellesley Physician Services, or down to 730 Main Street for the Metro West. Uh, we go there frequently. Are you able to project? Um I mean, do you have a way of projecting as to what the percentage rates are going to be going up and how it's going to impact the department? So what we do is we just look at historically. So historically, we're jumping 10 to 15 percent a year. Uh, and when we look at ambulance revenue, we'll kind of see that, you know, see that growth. Um, and that's what we're, you know, we kind of base it on. We plan on a 10 to 15 percent increase in call volume each year. Now, again, it can change. You know, um, we had a call, we had a day this year with that storm where we did 86 calls and mm -hmm. 20 hours, so like that, that depends on you know what we get each year, uh, but we do uh, you know to feel comfortable we say 10 to 15 percent we have to prepare for. Now that can change, again with a lot of these projects finishing up, more additions coming to them, more residents coming into town, we can see that jump. So, with respect to mutual aid, yep, would you cons would you say that over over a 12 month period? Of over a 12-month period of time that we provide more mutual aid than, than we receive? We do. And what would that percentage be? <clears throat> um, so we're going, we're going mutual aid about, I think I have it in here, it's about 150, 60 times a year. Um, and we're receiving it probably, you know, 25% of that, um, you know, probably in the 
40 to 50 range. And financially, how does that impact us? Uh, well, if we're going on uh, medicals, we're, uh, we're, we're recovering that with ambulance revenue. Uh, if we're going fire, it's a mutual aid agreement. You know, we go there, they come here. Um, so financially, as long as we're going and we're recouping the money through an ambulance revenue, then it's no, um, it's no real cost. How many, what would you say of the 160, how many of those would be non-compensated, fire-related or non-compensated ambulance? Mm, probably 15%. And that would be because of fire-related incidents. We go <coughs> quite a bit to mutual aid towns for fires. So uh, those are the ones we don't make any money back on. So if, with a small town like Millis, with larger towns surrounding us, there's, a, there's definitely going to be at some point where the larger towns get a benefit out of this as opposed to the benefit we receive from it. Obviously, we don't have as many calls that we have. How has that been discussed? With the other mutual aid communities? Yes. <clears throat> well, the problem is is that they're all kind of, the, even though they're bigger, they, they've run into the same problems we are. So like Medway, they've had a huge spike in growth, um, and they've prepared for it, they've staffed for it, but there's just not enough staff to go around. You, I mean, you can go into Framingham, and they're just never going to be able to handle every call. It's always, you're always going to rely on mutual aid some way. And my last question, so let's say that the town of Medway or some other town that we provide mutual aid to decides that their budgets are too small or too high and they're going to cut back. Yep. What happens then? It would mean an increase in call volume for all their mutual aid communities. And this is something that's happened over the years. This is how we actually became full-time 20-plus years ago in 2000 was we were relying on the town of Medfield to provide an ambulance. The town of Medfield said, hey, we're not doing it anymore. It's just it's costing us money. We're going into your town. We're not seeing the benefit of you coming to our town. We're not going to do it anymore. And that's when the town of Miller said, all right, we need to, we need to look at this hard. <clears throat> and I think that's what you're going to see with some of the other communities. You know, we see a town like Shervin, who have no full-time staff, making the transition to full-time staff. The town of Holliston, same thing. They're much bigger than us. Um, they rely on call. Um, they're having a really hard time with it where they get a lot of, Medway goes there 10, 12 times a week and they're starting to make the transition to full time as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it just seems like this could get out of hand after a while. Is there any discussion regarding um, a system whereby all of the towns get together and provide a budget for mutual aid? That they that they work off of. Yeah, no, there has been no discussion like that. Um, the things that we're we're getting concerned about and uh, prepared for is what we're seeing at hospitals with long wait times. We're starting to see where we would go in, drop a patient off in a half an hour. Now we are an hour and fifteen minutes. Where we say standing on the wall, that's starting to impact some of the mutual aid. Where an ambulance goes and they're tied up for that long, it's a higher chance that they would need to get somebody mutual aid in. And I know some of the towns use uh, a private ambulance yep. service. Have, have the mutual aid groups here thought about that? The problem is with uh, private ambulance services, they will not guarantee an ambulance. They will say, we can contract with you, but they won't guarantee. Because it's a zero bid, they can't guarantee they're going to get a call, so they're not going to put anybody here. We, we dealt with this years ago when we decided to make the transition to full time. We use the town of Framingham, who's a completely um, private ambulance company. <clears throat> um, they are supposed to guarantee Framingham four trucks at the ALS level. Nine times out of ten, there's two trucks ALS, one truck BLS, and then they have to wait for a truck to come from another town. Framingham is considered taking over EMS as well because um, they're putting all the money out and not seeing any revenue back. Thank you. Good. <clears throat> and again, just with the call volume of fire, we're seeing the same thing. You know, uh, we had new construction, we had new alarms, we had sprinklers. All this means uh, more responses on the fire side. Um, <clears throat> we're also seeing um, true fire calls. We're seeing incidents where um, not only are they false alarms, we're going middle of the night for true carbon monoxide detector alarms. We're going for true fires. Um, so we're seeing that all grow. Uh, the big thing we talk about is new construction. Uh, new construction safe, it's great. Um, and it is for the homeowner. For the fire department, it's a nightmare because they build these homes so tight. Um, a lot of the stuff, uh, no ventilation, fires can build quickly in them, and 
they will spread rapidly unless they're sprinkled. Now everybody says, oh, there's so many detectors and there's all this and a new construction won't burn. The town of Medway, um, Willow on Village Street where they have their 125 bed memory care Alzheimer's unit, they also have uh, units around it like we do up on Dover Road. And they've had two structure fires there. Uh, one very significant uh, and one enough that you know, the homeowner caught it quick enough that they were able to extinguish it. So the belief that new construction won't burn is just false because when they burn, they burn really fast. Most of it is uh, man-made materials. The wood is not true lumber. Um, so we have big concerns when we see fires in newer homes. Uh, <clears throat> so to the budget. Um, as you can see, <clears throat> On the salary side, most of it is contractual raises. Um, the fire wages are annual increase. The rescue wages, um, are all those wages that you see there are taken from the ambulance revenue account. Um, the wages overtime, again, overtime is dependent on call volume. Uh, we can try to control it, um, and I missed that whole step <laughs> of my presentation at the beginning, but one of the ways that we were trying to control that is when we started to see such a repetitive uh, time where the calls were coming in multiple times, uh, I instituted what's called a group recall system. Um, so when the ambulance is committed to transport to the hospital, um, I do a group recall. I bring one person back rather than four or five. We bring one person back so that they're able to help staff the second ambulance. So that means when part of the shift goes to the hospital, we bring one back. We have enough people to take that next medical. When it gets to the third one, that's when we trigger the more overtime where we bring people in. So we've been able to, you know, kind of control it a little bit, and it's worked out, you know, because again, my goal is to make sure that I can provide uh, an ambulance when it's required. And every time that we do these group recalls, we end up having a call where these people are able to respond. Um, so that, to us, is important. You'll see our on-call personnel has increased because we're relying on them so much. We have them coming back for calls. We have them covering shifts. Um, the big thing for us is right now, we have three members out injured. One has been over a year, one's been over eight months, um, and the other is about six months. All that time, we have to bring people in to cover them. Training over time again, uh, it's due to uh, you know, requirements set forth by the state, by the federal government things that each member has to train on, um, so we had an increase in that. Um, the biggest thing I want to kind of highlight is of the total salary budget, $814,682 comes out of ambulance revenue. Um, that is over, that's about 40% of the total budget is not from taxation, it comes out of ambulance revenue. Is that on this sheet here or not? Yep. What line? Well, um, if you look wages. at rescue wages, yeah, okay, and you look at clerical, yeah, those two items are all come out of. I see it. Ambulance revenue. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> to me, I would challenge you to find somebody else that's providing forty percent of the budget that's not from taxation, um, and this is where this is on the back of the guys and the women and men of the fire department who are doing the calls. Um, that revenue is dictated by them going out. So, you know, that there is kind of a big deal to me. Any questions on that? I do. Uh, we, we talk about the ambulance sheet in a second because I think that's you. important. Thank you. Coming up. <laughs> I know. <laughs> the anticipation. Yep. I'm writing down my questions and then crossing them off. I know. I know. I know. Like, that's good. <laughs> Any questions on the budget at this point? That part? No? No. I think we're good. So ambulance revenue. Um, you know, this is always a hot topic, and over the last two years, I've been trying to make sure that you truly understand what it is and how we use it and why it's here. Again, I'm just trying to make sure that we can see it. <clears throat> so, ambulance revenue. Again, that comes when we do an ambulance call, and the, uh, our billing agency bills the uh, insurance company. We get the revenue back. Monthly, we have what's the turnovers, where... The, uh, the company's called Comstar, they send out the invoices, we get the money back, it gets deposited, and in that yellow line you can see a month-by-month month breakdown. 
You will see from February to June, we just use a standard number because we haven't collected those yet. They're all new. Um, so we're anticipating to collect about $638,000 this year in ambulance revenue. Again, you can see we're up about $50,000 over last year. Um, that 53, I'm, you know, we're going to say that's, that's moderate. You're going to see, you know, more. We've had um, some busy months. We had uh, <coughs> a software issue with uh, the billing agency where 154 calls didn't get invoiced, and they just recently did, so we're hoping to see that kind of big bump. So from there, you'll see um, how this works is at the end of the year, a certain amount is taken out transfer it over at town meeting, and then we start the year with a number. So in the red, you'll see the July 1st balance uh, was 963. <clears throat> you add in those collections of the 638, gives us an available balance of about $1.6 million. Yep. I just want to pause for a sec. Sure. Uh, in all of our handouts, uh, our numbers are slightly different. Yeah, because you had, you had one a month older. I wanted to have Yeah, I've got the five months stuff. versus the seven months. Yeah, I, I just want to point that out to everybody. Yep. Everyone cool with that? Mm -hmm. Everyone understand? Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, so then after that, if that 814 that we talked about comes out, that leaves us with a starting balance for the next fiscal year of $787,000. Um, then we repeat the process all over again. So we start with the 787, we collect, again, roughly it's going to be, if it's a 10% increase, somewhere around 700000 give or take. The big difference this year is that this is 100% uh, the members... 51% of the department coming out of ambulance revenue. Before there was a percentage because we did this with the grant. For three years we were funded through a federal grant and only a percentage was coming out. The end of last fiscal, we had a, like 75% of it was covered. Some of it had to come out of the ambulance revenue. We had a whole uh, presentation on that. This year that's why that number is a lot bigger because all of that is coming out this year. In addition to paying for all the guys, there's other things that we're going to get to. But one of the things that we did do is we created um, an ambulance replacement fund, and we're going to transfer money from here into there so that our goal is to purchase the next ambulance without having to go in front of the taxpayers. We haven't transferred that money yet because this is the first year that we would see all of that come out, so we really wanted to get a good handle on how much is coming out? How does it affect the ambulance revenue? And are we prepared to, you know, take a certain amount out? That's safe. That still makes it so that we can fund everything that we had. Chief, can I ask a quick question? Sure. So, uh, going back to your total budget uh, for FY two, uh, twenty-five, you, you have twenty uh, two million five ninety-six nine seven two. Yep. How much of that is paid by um, ambulance revenue? About eight hundred thousand. 800,000 of it. Yeah. Okay. So that when you look up. So this total number would be from the taxpayer is uh, what? Uh, 1.7? 1.7, yep. Okay. And what's the percentage of collection versus invoice? So uh, we have a good rate with the company there. It's about 94%. Uh, they do a good job. Uh, we try not to, you know, send things to collections, but they work really hard to make sure that we recoup all the money that we so you use a third party to do that? We use a third party, And yep. what do they take as a collection fee? Uh, I think it's 5% or 4%. No. And it's been negotiated. We've worked with over the years. Again, they, they represent probably 210 departments in the state of Massachusetts. So it's great to use them for a resource to figure out, hey, what, what do we want to charge for ambulance rates? So when we change a rate, we have a good pool to pull from to say, hey, look, all these other communities are charging that same rate as well. Thank you. So this slide here just shows you what else comes out of um, ambulance revenue. Uh, you know, you see the rescue wages, the department assistant uh, that we split with the fire, uh, the police chief, uh, her salary comes out of here. And then uh, a couple years ago, I pushed really hard for a um, preventative maintenance uh, account because we had so many things and were required by, you know, the state to have things on our EMS stuff. And a big portion of that comes out of uh, ambulance revenue as well, $23,000. And then uh, we did a couple increases to medical supplies and our consulting services, and both of those also come out of the ambulance revenue. That's how the total becomes the 814682 Questions? Everybody good? Good? Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> 
And then the spending highlights for FY25 expenses. Again, uh, we try to be moderate with the increases, but there are increases. Um, you know, I used the example of the other one on the news. They had a big discussion on how much groceries cost nowadays. Mm -hmm. So if you had gone grow me and Pete meet at Shaw's all the time to go shop. Um, it's our thing. We bump into each other every time. But, you know, if you've gone to a grocery store, you've seen that increase. We're seeing the same exact increase. You can't buy your stuff from Market Basket? No. no. I don't know if the state would allow More for your dollar? No. But we, uh, you know, we do, we, we have seen a big increase in medical supplies and our supplies and expenses. The bigger thing is that we've seen a big delay in delivery. Uh, you know, we're going to talk about that a little bit later as well. But that's one of the things that hurts us, is that if we don't prepare for it, uh, we can get caught not having enough. Um, call volume also dictates that, where we're using the equipment so much, we have to replace it quicker. So we're seeing those increases go up as well. Um, the question, is this yep. a combination of um, frequency of use versus increasing costs in the actual um, yeah. supplies? Yes. Okay. Yes, because again, like I said, with call volume, it's just we're pumping that equipment yep. out and we have to replace it. So. Um, training, again, we're required to, um, you know, have uh, continuing education. The state keeps throwing things at us, and I, I think I used the example last year. Uh, they mandated that we all get trained on, um, you know, taking care of uh, the police canine dog. That's statewide. Didn't matter if you had a dog or not. You had to have that training. They didn't fund it. They just said, you got to do it, and they made it a state requirement. So all these things kind of keep popping up for us, um, and we're always excited when it comes out. But uh, So we're trying to prepare for that as well. Our consulting services, again, those are our med control doctors. <coughs> An ambulance must have a doctor that's affiliated with a hospital. Ours is out of uh, Metro West Framingham. And there's a new doctor that has moved in. Her fee's a little bit higher than the previous one. Again, we don't have a whole lot of choice because we're required by the state to have that. Uh, so we see a bump in that. <coughs> And then we talked about the uh, supplies and expenses and uh, medical supplies. And then we said maintenance fire, a preventive uh, maintenance line item. Again, which comes, majority of it comes from ambulance revenue. When we sign contracts for these maintenance things, we are seeing, you know, a 5 to 8% increase every time a contract comes out. Um, so, again, we, we kind of prepared for that and moved that line up a little bit there. Um, you know, we can go through it line by line, but you'll see a lot of it's not... We didn't have any big increases. We try to keep it within range and hopefully budgeted enough that we're able to cover the cost to keep working. Anything? No? Uh, so again, just non-tax funding, um, where we get our stuff from. Again, ambulance revenue is the biggest one. We've talked about that 40%. Uh, the other areas that we collect fees are permits and inspections, new construction plan review and inspections. And grants. Again, we're trying for every grant possible. Uh, anytime one comes up, we're gonna we're gonna apply for it. Right now, we're working with the town of Bellingham on a regional grant with them um, for portable radios. Um, a couple years ago, I got some money to try to upgrade our radios, but they're so expensive. Well, that was when they were five thousand dollars. We were just informed that the new ones are eleven thousand um, dollars that meet the new NFPA requirement. So for us, that's over three hundred thousand dollars to outfit our department. Working with the town of Bellingham, we're putting in for a federal grant for them to get 30, us to get 30. Um, the one thing that we have going for us is the new chief in Bellingham was the chief in Hopkinton and got this grant last year for Hopkinton and Ashland. So we hope he has the template that's going to be successful for us this year. That's a big deal. If we're able to do that, that's $300,000 off our plate. That's portable radios that are 8 to 10 years before we have to start replacing again. But again, technology, you know, they could tell us in three years, we need a different radio. So, so those are the areas that we have non-tax funding. <clears throat> so the, again, this year we're, you know, we're putting in a request for above level service. Um, you know, I'm looking to add uh, some administrative staff. The biggest thing for us has always been, for me, uh, boots on the ground. I need, I need people who can work. I never worried about administrative staff. I didn't worry about our department assistant. You know, we did that when we split it with the police uh, chief. The biggest thing for me was make sure we had the guy, the personnel that respond to calls. We're at the point now that we're seeing such a load on our EMS coordinator that uh, while he's on duty, trying to do his firefighter paramedic duty and his uh, EMS coordinator duty, the call volume so much that he's just not able to do it. 
again, he has to come in a lot off, uh, off duty, he has to go to a lot of meetings. Um, and as I stated at the beginning of the meeting, when we lost our uh, on-call deputy chief, he was the, you know, the, the number two. When I wasn't there, he was the guy that, you know, Mr. Gazinski would contact. Um, without him, now we, we just have our lieutenants and our staff. Again, one of the big things Millis has been pushing for years is succession planning. You know, let's get people in place so that, you know, I joked earlier, when I've had enough of this and I get out of here, uh, we have somebody who can kind of step in and take the role. Um, so this is, you know, a step in that direction as well to kind of meet that requirement. The goal is that he will, uh, the person who gets the job will also be considered um, the fifth during those day shifts so that when we had that recall, I won't need to do that right away. You know, I'll be able to staff both those ambulances right away, not have to do a recall, still have a captain who's available to respond to the next incident, and then, again, we're still at the third incident, but we've cut out that second incident where we had to bring somebody back in. His duties would be the EMS coordinated duties um, and then a uh, inspection code compliance officer. Right now, <clears throat> the guys on duty are doing that uh, as, it, as well as I am. The big problem is we're missing a lot of these inspections. If you don't know contractors, they get upset when you're not there, especially when they have people lined up to test an alarm and we're not there, they'll take, hey, sorry, we're on a call only so much, and then it's, you know, we've, it's costing them money. So we're getting a lot of kind of feedback on that. Um, so our goal is to try to, you know, with this position, have him be the inspection officer, go to those inspections, meet the requirement, do some of the plan review, um, and kind of help us uh, with all of that. Just some local departments that have the some of these positions, Medway has two full-time deputy chiefs, Medfield has a full-time EMS coordinator, Norfolk, two full-time deputy chiefs, Bellingham, one deputy chief and an EMS coordinator, same thing in Ashland, and Halston just hired a full-time deputy chief slash EMS coordinator to kind of handle the same thing because they're seeing you know, the same problems we are. Chief, would this position eliminate any overtime? I will say yes, but I can't guarantee it. It will cut down on that group recall where I bring somebody back to staff that second ambulance. I won't need to do that when, he, when this person is available. Uh, again, it'd be an administrative st uh, schedule, so you know, there'd be a four-day work week or we'd work out a five-day or however it goes. Um, so on the weekends and at nights, it would still kind of go back to the same. But we, we could see a reduction on those, you know, that, those second medicals that we respond. So you're not going to be replacing a deputy chief. No. You're going to, so that salary that the deputy chief will go towards this salary? But again, he was an on-call deputy chief, so it's, okay. a, it's much less than right. this. The reason we're not making that jump to that deputy chief is I just, I, I didn't think the appetite for that salary would be, uh, you know, something somebody would consider right now. Okay. It's a big jump to go from nothing to that. Going to a captain, I felt like it was more reasonable and we could kind of, you know, show that it works. So. And that was what, a 90 to 120 000. Right, and that's, again, that's up for negotiation because it's part of... I mean, yeah, he's, yeah, it's part of the, they would be part of the union. So it's still something that has to be negotiated and added to the current contract. That's just a salary range that we have that would be the next step up from the lieutenants. Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Um, I was just wondering if this um, per this um, person who's already on, who's already on duty and going to be transitioning kind of more to this type of role. Do you think that you would need to replace him we more do. boots on the ground? Okay, so yeah. hiring another. Yep. Okay. So in that there, um, you know, we would be adding this ninety to one hundred, but the salary of that lieutenant would then be much less because we'd be bringing in somebody new. So I can't say there'd be a savings, but you would see a reduction in that payroll compared to this so I will say that I feel you're very very efficient with your funds we try to be no no but it's in I I really I just I was privileged to hear this the other day when you presented to the select board and what I came out of it is how professional and how businesslike you are um, and that you truly save the town money um, that that grant writing is an important factor and without that grant writing the town would be in in a lot of trouble so I just want to thank you for that thank you 
The one thing I always like to remind everybody is that 90% uh, of my staff are Miller's taxpayers, including myself. So we fill the brunt just like everybody else. Do you have a question, Kathy? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, could you tell me, uh, give me a little bit about the income from inspectional services, Chief? Yep. Because I just, let me just preface this, sure. this little web webinar that was the other day. Um, you can fund your cost for inspectional services 100% from fees. And I'm just wondering if anyone has done a calculation as to exactly what your monthly, yearly costs are for inspectional services versus the income derived therefrom. That's a great question. That I wish I had that before because I would have got I, that you number. Know, I'm it's really, great. I, me too. It really is. You know, um, that would be something we should definitely look at. Okay. The problem is, is that we meet. We have to meet the state requirement on the fees, and they have, you know, a small parameter that they let us go in. We can't just, hey, this inspection is two thousand dollars. You know, they have a fifty or a hundred dollars. So, we've met that requirement. So that would be something we would definitely have to weigh. Like, what is the allowable charge for those inspectional services? and how much can we actually make to help supplement some of this fund. But that is definitely something worth looking into. And also, um, to kind of piggyback on the vice chair a couple of weeks ago, are you calling FTEs full-time employees yep. or full-time equivalents? I call them full-time employees. Okay, so <laughs> yeah. that's what if I there's thought eight they were. people, there's eight insurance plans. Well, not always <laughs> not because not, not yeah, everybody all takes them take that. It, but there's not 10 it. from Two no. half timers. Okay, no. thank you about yeah. that. Yeah. I, that's to my use your name and band. Well, I the know. schools <laughs> call it full time, yeah, it was a full time uh, equivalent. Yeah, I was always told it was employees, so that's how we, we kind of tried to the say that in the meeting, and I was castigated by the former chair. No, I yeah. love Former chair. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, we were kidding about it, but that's the way I always saw it, too, and people are no full time equivalents. I'm okay. like, well, that, then we better define that. Well, the schools refer so, to it that way, and I think municipal <laughs> refers yeah. to it. I have a feeling Michael's like going to use that former chair a lot. <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah, especially when he's not here. When he's <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Can't defend himself. Craig is ahead of him. Oh. Uh, we use FTE. I, I, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, don't complicate it. No, <laughs> don't go down there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right, it's go ahead. Excellent. And then, then just a capital request. Um, again, I did see one of the questions. Can we drag out the, the vehicles? We have a five-year replacement plan. Can we drag it out? That's what I currently do. So we're on 12 years on this replacement. We dragged it out six. By the time we get the vehicle, it'll be seven. And we do the same thing with the ambulance. Our goal is to try to make it as last as long as we can. We have it on that five-year rotation just to kind of keep it in a rotation so that we're not seeing uh, huge repair costs. And that's kind of where we are with this vehicle. We're 70,000 miles. It's an emergency response vehicle. We're starting to see some of the costs go up. Um, and that is the reason that we went for it. It's been on the capital replacement plan since the capital replacement plan has been put in place. Um, so there's no surprises there, but that's where we are. Are we happy about the price? Absolutely not. It's what we're given. Um, you should have seen the quote in there. We're not, we were shocked by it, but that's, that's what it came in as. Um, you know, some upcoming capital replacements uh, plans. You know, we have our engine five and our brush two, which are both brush vehicles. The goal is to eliminate two, drop down to one by one vehicle that meets both requirements. I did the same thing when we did the ladder. I got rid of two pieces of apparatus to kind of have one. <clears throat> and then again, the ambulance, when it is time to replace, it's gonna take 40 months to build. And you can say, well, it's a long time. Uh, I warned you two years ago when we bought the engine, it would take two years to build, and it wow. did. Um, so my goal is to request the ambulance replacement next year. We don't have to fund it, we just have to approve that I can order it because it's gonna take that 40 months. In that time, the goal is to save enough money in that revenue fund to be able to replace that. Um, so that's where we stand with the capital request. So, the re so the, the, it's right now where you're anticipating, or at the end of 2024, you had 996575 in that account. Is that gonna go toward capital expenditures or where does that money generally go? The leftover? Yes. Uh, balance that you have. The balance it stays in there and it just kind of regrows. That, that's how it starts over for next year. That's what we start with next next fiscal year. But I think it's less than that. Okay, because because yeah. I'm looking from here, FY 2022 is 794, 
23 was 963, 24, uh, 23 was 24 is 996. So a million dollars is sitting in that account at any given time, roughly, right? Well, roughly. But then this year, um, I, I don't know if I can get to the, go back to that slide. But. So if you see, the balance is going to be 787. You're anticipating that yeah. for, okay. Yeah, because after we take that 814 from the 16, uh, from the 1.6 million will be about that 787. Okay. And we can't use that for anything? I'm not sure. That's where Carol comes into play that, you know, we've always had to make sure that we meet the uh, DOR requirements with ambulance revenue. Uh, it can only be used on things that are associated with the ambulance right, right. because that's where it's really come from. That's why we can purchase an ambulance with it, but yeah. I don't think we can buy other capital stuff with it. Mm -hmm. But again, we would have to check with I don't hey, know if Mike knows, but. Go ahead, Craig. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it has to be used for ambulance purposes, but buying an ambulance is absolutely one of the purposes, and that's one of the things that's anticipated. Right. Right. So at some point, it'll drop to, I can't read that, um, the, um, <laughs> the 700,000 this year, adding 50,000 a month back, 56,000 a month back on new sales or pickups, I'm sorry. Right. Um, <laughs> and, uh, then at the end of that, you'll take 800000 out for next year's fees, but whatever's left after that, and it will be something north of 800000 at that point, you will be able to buy a new ambulance with that money. See, and the goal or is, but a lot of a new ambulance yeah, with right. that money. The goal is, you know, ambulance revenue and the cost kind of travel like this. You know, we kind of see it growing. The concern is that if we take... 450,000 from that, then it's like that, you know, we're, we just want to make sure that we're always going to have enough in there yeah. to continue to pay for the staff. And you don't know the amount yet that you would donate to the, or contribute to the ambulance fund? For next year? Yeah. No, because it's, again, I, I think you can anticipate a 10% okay. safe, a 10% increase. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if we, again, if we go back, is there? Yeah. Uh, you know, so like we said, it was 580 last year. It's 638 this year. You know, we had some 10 percent. You know, we're you know, just about 700,000. So rather than that 1.6, we're 1.4. <clears throat> take out 900,000. You know, so that's the only thing is, is the cost for the staff is going to go up. We've got to make sure that we have enough data to fund it. But we can definitely, like I said, DOR has strict requirements on this, like Craig was saying. So it has to. That's how we can use it for. Um, the department assistant because she handles a lot of the information that comes in from our billing agency and does the turnovers with the town so she can be paid for out of that and then again the medical supplies and the maintenance and um, our med control can come out of it because it's all associated with the ambulance. So for presumably this new position part of that could be paid out of it too right? We can definitely check yep. And just to go back to the car request. Yep. Um, so according to the capital plan, as you mentioned, this car is on track in terms of its replacement yep. timeline. Yep. Um, I thought it was interesting going through the request here and in rough numbers, it's like a $50,000 car, but it's a 20,000 plus for all the Yeah, so it's about 59,000. Yeah. So the goal, what we're hoping is that that, again, that's a budgetary number. That's not it's yeah, not yeah. a vehicle. It's not sitting there waiting for me. That's a budgetary number that they gave us. My hope is that we can reduce some of that. You know, a lot of stuff in there that we're not going to need or we're not going to request. That's the standard thing that they kind of throw Cup out. Cup holders. Understood. I know. That was a big thing. I circled that. Yeah. So. Could you, can you just not have totally dark light uh, totally, yep. screen? Uh, yep. What is it? Window? Tinted windows. Window. 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 We don't have it's that. It's on it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's window window included. Yes. Is it really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you, you may get a question also at town meeting about air conditioning. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So, again, I, I, you know, John brought up uh, the, the cup holders. You know, for me. <laughs> you did. I did? Yeah. I did. did. I want to know yeah. what kind of cups exactly. are going in those holders. It's not a request. I wasn't like, hey, I need four cup holders. But uh, when they take out the console to put the radios in and the lights and all that, they put in cup holders. So I can have a coffee as I'm driving to a call. I, but I that's like it. It's good to be explained. If we need to cut that, I'm sure it's $28. I'll <laughs> yeah. pay for it myself. Yeah, so, <laughs> all right. Um, so what's the lead time on getting that done, too? That's the other thing it's un that's so unsure because, just like us, other towns are going to be buying, you know, trying to buy them. So, it, that's why I say it'll be seven years. I, I think it's probably going to be five to six months uh, okay. lead time. So, you know, we can't order it until 
July 1st. So, you know, we'll probably look at maybe a Christmas present. Uh, and then just an equipment detail, capital replacement update. So the new engine uh, that we bought two years ago has arrived in Massachusetts. Um, it is a beautiful truck. It's going to do uh, great things for the town of Millis. Uh, the biggest thing that I saw, I was able to uh, travel to the beautiful state of Wisconsin during January to visit it. I really wish it was somewhere warm, but it wasn't. Um, but the big thing that jumped out was we ordered it two years ago and we paid six hundred forty-eight thousand for it. If we were to buy the truck today, it's a million dollars. Um, that's how quickly these prices are going up, and wow. it's staggering. The good news is uh, this is the last engine we'll have to buy for a while, at least as I'm chief. Um, so you have we have a while. The ladder truck is still um, going to be here for a while. That's a scary number right now. That's two point two million dollars to replace the ladder truck. So we're in a good stance. We do have some smaller vehicles to replace, which are much less than this. Um, but again, not a whole lot. This is the last big apparatus I will buy. Chief, one question I always hear is, you know, ambulance comes out and a pump a truck goes with it. Yep. Not unique to Millis. Anyway. Nope. And can you explain why sure. that is? Yeah, it's a great question. So I will tell you that when I started in 2000, it was uh, me and one other person. And we did all the medicals in town. And we had um, our police department respond with us. And those guys had to carry everything because we were taking care of the patient. Um, as call volume went up, they were less available. <clears throat> and new requirements with EMS is a lot of times we will go with four and three will have to transport with the patient. So again, the four is um, a lot of the equipment that has to go in, a lot of the carrying the patient out, um, you know, un unfortunately for us, the big ones are always on the second and third floor. Um, so that's the biggest thing is that's how we do it. Um, and that's what you see um, kind of all over. And what it does too is it also helps with injury uh, because you don't have two people trying to carry 300 pound people. So the reason you have the pumper there it, with them as opposed to sending them in another vehicle is yep. if a call came, call they could go in. right out? Yep, and again, like I said, We've seen that, we had that today. They were on a medical, they had to leave for a gas leak. While at the gas leak, another medical, um, the ladder truck had to go to. To the point that me and Chief Sophia had to respond to the car accident because all police officers and all firefighters available were out. Um, and we had to wait for our ambulance to come back from Milford Hospital. Um, so again, that's the, it's just to be ready for the next call. You know, and you can say, you know, do we have to? I don't want to have to answer that question when we have a Stony Brook come in and there's no fire truck to go. So we're prepared for it. I'm sorry, what were you referring it to? What were you calling it? A pumper? A pumper, pumper truck. Pumper truck. Yeah, it's and what is a pumper truck? Has water on it. Um, yep. <laughs> you, you have a pumper yeah. and you have a ladder truck. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, yeah. 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 One I'm has not the water, a little boy, so I have to play yeah. fire trucks. Yeah. Yeah. But there are trucks that have no water on it, too. But these, uh, yeah, all of our trucks carry water. That's what, we're very lucky. We have 88% of the town covered in hydrants. But when we arrive with our trucks, we come with 1,000 gallons of water. We can do a lot of damage with 1,000 gallons mm -hmm. of water. And I, we have a great hydrant system, so it works out very well for us. I do have a question. Yeah, though. good. Um, when you go out on calls, and you may have answered this already, so I apologize, but when you go out on calls, I always oftentimes see the police that it's police, fire truck, ambulance. Is that a state mandate, or is that, why is the, re, what is the purpose of having, is it for safety purposes? Yep, so the problem is, is that we hate to say this, but uh, a lot of our calls, we have to have a police officer there. A lot of times just to kind of keep order, keep crowd control. Um, more and more frequently, they're there to protect us. Um, and, and we're lucky here in most because we work so closely with our police department. A lot of towns don't get the response from the police department. Um, ours do a great job of responding with us. And you know, several times have protected us, and we've had to protect them, so. OK, that's what I thought, but I just want to clarify. Mm -hmm. That is it. That's okay, it. good job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody have any other final like questions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, FY23, Chief, how, yeah. how are your percentages so far six months into the budget? 
Good. I Overtime. wish I brought those, but we're doing. Yeah, we're right on track. Uh, we always try to measure this. So I always say, you know, we're seven months in, so we should be in the sixty percent, seventy percent range, um, and we are right on track with all of them. Uh, the only areas that again that we uh, suffer with is the shift coverage. Uh, overtime, we're okay, but shift coverage is big because we have those three members out. Um, so we're uh, we're a little higher on that. And lastly, I just what do you, Chief? What do you tell the residents and taxpayers if the requested increases don't go through? How will it affect them? So you're asking for I, I some. Yeah. Where I don't know, we don't know where the money's coming from, but yeah. what what will you say that you you feel would truly justify this to the people to support this? Um, it's, it's a great question and a tough question because every year, um, you know, we, we mentioned it at the select board meeting, um, I come with a budget and then me, Mike, and Carol sit down and that budget has to get reduced. So we're always prepared for that. Um, I think all I can say is that um, with or without the funding that we've asked for, we're going to continue to provide the highest level of service that we can. Um, and we, you know, if we're unable to respond, we're going to make sure that somebody is able to respond. Um, but, um, but, like I said, that's a very tough question to kind Thank of you. Thank you for them. thinking about it. I appreciate you coming in and okay. giving us a, a, a full description of your budget and narrative and um, capital uh, planning, et cetera. Um, you know, one thing that I tried to do is I met with Chief beforehand, just primarily because this was my first meeting, and it was actually very helpful for me, and I actually encourage others to, to reach out as well. Uh, I think communication's big. I also re requested from everybody here to funnel questions my way, which some of you did, which is fantastic, and I got those over to Rick. So if we can try to keep that efficiency with all presentations and departments, I think that the conversations and what we learn uh, is vital. Yeah, so. and again, I, I really appreciate that because um, it gives us time. I don't want to come here and not be able to answer one of your questions. So if you have something that I don't have in a presentation, it's just tough to not to be able to answer it. Yeah. And I think it's a great line of communication. And like John said, I mean, my door's open. You know, it's your building. It is. You know, your door's always you know, been open. Stop by. I would love to explain how we operate and go into detail on anything you want. It's a, we're an open book, and you know, uh, I think you know when you leave, you'll be impressed and you'll be proud of the department that you you provided us. So, perfect. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank Have you. a great evening. You too. I'm excited to see the new truck. Yeah. Well, hopefully in two weeks. It's getting outfitted with the equipment right now. So hopefully in two weeks. Going to do a parade around town. We're not going to do a parade. He's going to glide around with the lights on. Save that for baseball. Right? Save that for the Throw candy. Yeah, the first, first summer I was here in that, or spring, and, and uh, it was uh, June, I believe, or May. And I'm uh, hearing a fire, you know, sirens, sirens. I'm, oh my God, there must be a major fire here. Oh my God. It was the parade for the seniors. Uh, yes. <laughs> it's, it's like, I'm ready to get on there. Like, what the heck? This is bad. Yeah, that first year. Blowing. We got a lot of complaints that first year. A lot of people didn't know about it. So. But again, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay. Great job. Yeah. Uh, moving along uh, to Finance Committee meeting minutes approval for January 17th, 2024, which Deidre passed out to all of us. Move to approve the minutes. Second. There's been a motion to approve and a second in. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? Nope. Um, liaison updates. Anyone besides myself have liaison updates? No? All good. Um, so for the Capital Planning Committee, um, few capital requests have come through, um, and I'll just go down the list right now. Um, Fires requested the replace car two, which we just talked about at 85,000. These are round numbers. Uh, libraries requesting 35,000 for exterior building repairs. Uh, town buildings is requesting a boom lift for 45,000. Um, the veteran memorial building stairs uh, need repair at 150,000. Council on Aging is requesting a vehicle replacement for 10,000. IT 
is requesting a server pro MPS, Millis Public School server project for sixty-five thousand. Schools requesting a sixty-seven thousand dollars skid steer. Um, IT is also requesting seventy thousand for Millis Public School switch project. I don't know what that means. Uh, animal control DPW have also requested some things, but at the time of the meeting, we didn't have numbers. So, th so this is just the the preliminary items that have come in. We have a we meet tomorrow actually, in terms of starting to refine what those capital requests will be. Okay. I think one one question would be my suggestion would be um, when we're talking about technology, and, you know, seventy five thousand dollars server replacement and so forth. I mean, nowadays most companies are getting away from physical servers, everything being placed on the internet. Um, Agreed. But so, you know, yeah. the that cloud, you know, so um, I can certainly see the switch network switching because they're still using, although even that, I mean, you know, functionally using, you know, CAD5 as opposed to wireless. But um, I think, you know, we, st we should start, or at least they should really start looking at both wireless communication within the buildings as opposed to, you know, spending $50,000 on network switching and also uh, looking at cloud-based systems I mean, the biggest problem we have is if someone gets into our server, we're dead. Mm -hmm. When it's on the cloud, it's far more difficult. And, and then, you know, you don't have us trying to figure it out. You have, you know, AWS trying to figure it out. Um, so, you know, it might be a question to bring up there um, in terms of do we, are we really looking ahead or are we just planning from four years ago? You know, the so, systems that we're rebuilding, it's, we're rebuilding right. it with the same stuff. This isn't the first time this request has come through from the schools. I remember this came last year, and we asked them to look into cloud services as opposed to that. Mm, I guess oh. they didn't make sure they hear you. Hey. So yeah. um, I'd be curious to hear what the school has to say about that. Yep. Yeah. And I, uh, IT is coming in as well uh, mm -hmm. for presentations. Well, Good. Yeah. Good. Great. And if we could get clarified what FTE is, because really <laughs> I think we have to ask. I think I with think every it budget depends on each department. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. As we can see. Yeah. All right. Because I think. Well, I made reference that the schools have referred to it as full-time. Oh yeah. Uh, um, equivalent and. But the fire department is full-time yeah. employee. Right, and Mr. Schultz said that that wasn't correct, and then was going to start yeah. explaining. So I, I think that perhaps we need to find out. Should is it if, if each department has a different, but there's a perfect, there is an acceptable terminology so that everybody's on the same yeah, page. Yeah, I, I, I think I think we ask each department. I, I think yeah. it's a gray area. Go ahead. I was just going to say, instead of asking each department, why don't we ask who they answer to and just get from Mr. Kaczynski what the town policy is on FTE? Well, that's instead of I mean. asking 13 exactly. questions, let's ask one. Just the one and find out what FTE is supposed to be. Yeah. And I will trust Fair Mr. Enough. Gazinski on that, but I will verify. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but if we can say Mr. Verified. Gazinski says this is what the it English is. English version. <laughs> that's the standard. Well, that's what I'm trying. I guess, thank you very much, because that was what the point I was trying to make. We need to know what FT is. E is according to the town's regulations. Right. Policy and policy. how it's understood. Yeah. Correct. Right. Because so, Chair, um, yep. in, in looking at board and committee liaison updates, Perhaps it might be the right time, we talked about this a little bit before, of asking who wants to be liaisons to what groups and perhaps yeah. build more liaisons with more groups. Excellent. Agreed. And um, we're on the same page. I, I was thinking about that because I was going through the list the other day. Mm. There's a lot of different committees out there um, and whether or not people want to be on a committee or, or not or, or, or if it makes sense to have a FinCom rep well, represented. I'm on. I, I'm. I actually would like to very much to be the rep for the Council on Aging, if, uh, the liaison. Because I, think you are. Uh, I don't know <laughs> if it was official. I think I mentioned it, but I don't know if it ever became <laughs> official. I think. I think everyone stepped back, and you. You stepped. Oh, forward. is that what it was? Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't but see I agree that. with you. I agree with you. I think we should Maybe review we should that. Come up with a list of perhaps the most prominent ones. Yep. Um, we could talk about that. Yep. And then see in the next meeting who wants to start. Yep, I agree with that. Yep. Well, if I'm already on it, so. I'll, Mr. I'll, Chair? I'll, I'll yes, let please. Let everybody um, know what's going on. All set? Uh, the webinar that I don't know if you it's attended it, but it was um, repeated, and I'll uh, so make sure. So can I just hit pause for oh, one sure. second? So, so, what, so my intention um, for these meetings is to add old and new business mm -hmm. that you're talking about in a second. 
And my point of this is to talk about things as a group just to help digest information, process, and share. So with that, there's a few things that we're going to talk about now. And this it doesn't have to be monumentally long, but it's more of keeping everybody abreast of what's going on. So with that, Kathy, why don't you talk about the I, webinar? And I don't know if everyone, everyone saw it, but... Budgeting please. 101. It couldn't have been more informative. It was excellent. And um, what I would like to prepare for, uh, I don't know, in the next few days is a... Uh, sort of a summary, and I've got more questions than, um, but it's more on the town administrator, finance director side, rather than asking each department head, uh, basically, uh, my number one question, Mr. Chair, has, has the town administrator approved any of these budgets before they're before us, or are we looking at everything at first blush? I've been looking at everything at first blush. Because it was pretty evident that finance committee gets the town administrator's recommendations to work with. Sure, understood. And so here we are in taking all of this um, testimony, and will it come back that someone has changed something, or the town administrator has amended anything, and so we have to in turn re-review. Uh, I think that's a valid point. Um, I think um, in terms of what we're getting, all the budgets, I mean, I sat here all day on Monday and all the departments presented their budgets. I would imagine that's what's being presented is what we're looking at versus waiting for a, a, a different version. I'm sure, there, I'm sure different versions will come down the road. So we, we don't know if what the chief presented has been when his discussions with the town administrator, the town administrator okayed that budget? No, he just pre they just presented they on just Monday. They just presented. They just presented on Monday. They just presented, yeah. Yeah, I think that the town, my understanding, at least not necessarily here, but in other places, is that the, they present the budgets and then the, a selectman will eventually give their yay or nay, um, and then we obviously, you know, give our recommendations. So. I don't think they've gotten to that point yet, at least. Um, yeah, I, I mean... <clears throat> well, the town administrator probably should be thinking about... Because... Uh, well, and do, they, and are we going to get any financial? Like, this is what the forecast is, and any documents now? For revenue? No, there, there should be some sort of level-funded budget for FY25 out there. This is what the town needs mm. to run as it is yeah i to my knowledge i don't think that exists at this point okay I think so that's i'll prepare some maybe you can pass it on yeah, to somebody to discuss it with send it on to the finance yeah. committee so why don't we go discuss. back to the, the webinar do you have anything else to add on the no, uh, you know i i'm not just going to blabber about it now okay. mr chair i'd like to just put it in a yeah in a document put something together we can share make it amongst sense ourselves and, that's fine okay thank you um Moving along, uh, Mike has been helping me out uh, regarding uh, putting in our financial committee uh, summary into the fiscal, well, last year's budget, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want to talk about that just to bring everyone up to speed. Um, you know, in the, in the warrant book, uh, the, the FinCom, or at least the presentation of budgets, I should say, FinCom always gives, a, every, every town department gives a, a statement as to what went on during the year. Um, what they accomplished, uh, what they saw, things of that nature. Um, what we're preparing now is, is, is the same document for the FinCom. Um, it has been prepared every year uh, for the past how many. Um, so uh, we started kind of with a, a, a template of what was done in the years past, and then we'll um, you know, obviously modify it to what the exact things were that went on in this particular year. You mentioned things about town meeting, special town meeting, what went on, what were some of the highlights. Um, we're also mentioning, you know, the, uh, the position that we took on the uh, vocational school, uh, you know, uh, construction project. Um, so we should, we should have that finalized, you know, pretty soon um, and then maybe pass it around. It's been a huge help. I know we're probably, your 80% of it is complete, so we just need to round it out and then add up some of the numbers. So uh, that makes complete sense. Um, so I, I did uh, attend that webinar for a little bit, and there's a, a deck that I can circle around to everybody, and there's a recording as well. So, you know, my, my point is, uh, and, and, you know, it's kind of 
101, as you mentioned, um, but on the website, there's a bunch of other stuff that goes deeper. So if people want to dig and learn as much as they want, feel free. I know I am. <laughs> um, anything else that anybody might have? Joyce, you good? I'm good, thank you. All right, I think we're ready to make. Move we adjourn? Yep. Second. There's been a motion and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Well, congratulations to the first thing. Yeah. yeah. Early.